looking at verses 10 through 22. As you're turning there, um, when I was a teenager, uh, I loved the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Some of you have seen it, obviously. It was fun. It was funny. Um, I found it very entertaining uh, as a teenager. If you don't know the movie, first of all, if you're over 40 and you don't know the movie, shame on you. Um, but otherwise, if you, if you don't know it, Ferris Bueller is a high school student that everyone loves except for his sister and the principal of the high school. I'm just giving you a very basic summary. And he skips school and then convinces his girlfriend and another close friend to skip school with him. They go all over the city, avoiding getting caught by his dad and the principal of the high school. They take his friend's uh, dad's sports car for a drive. It's a lot, and it's fun. But as an adult, and even more as a parent, I see that movie differently than I did as a teenager. I don't find myself identifying with Ferris and seeing things through his eyes anymore. I mean, the movie is based on a lie. He lies about being sick so that he can skip school and then goes all over the city lying and being careless and steals his friend's dad's car and destroys said car. So as a father, I see that differently. I mean, if that was my kids, it wouldn't be funny or entertaining, right? I wouldn't, I wouldn't think, what, what great kids I have, right? I've done a, I've done a fine job here, right? Um, so I see it differently. And honestly, that's kind of how I, I feel about the book of Esther, except like way, way more. Um, it doesn't fit on an, a flannel graph anymore for me. Um, and it's not what I got in Sunday school. You have all of the glamour and decorations and greatness of the feasts in the beginning of chapter one that we talked about last week. And maybe, maybe you might have been caught up in that a little bit while you read it. But as we get into the story, we, we need to get behind the scenes. And it's not pretty behind the scenes. You think about this for a moment. Maybe during last week's sermon, you imagined being there as a guest for that feast. Drinking from golden goblets, hanging with the best and the brightest, enjoying the bounty of food and wine for days and days and days. But I wonder if anyone identified with the people we didn't see in those verses, but who were definitely there. Did I imagine what that debaucherous party was like for the servants? Who cleaned up the mess from months of drunken behavior? Who served the wine? We're going to get a glimpse into that side of things this morning. We're going to see that the one who has all of the power is not a good man. He dispatches others to do his dirty work. He makes decisions that are not for the good of those that he leads. He uses his power for his own agenda. So go ahead and stand. We're going to read verses 10 through 22. Esther chapter 1, beginning with verse 10. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mahuman, Bizda, Harbana, Bigtha, and Abagtha, Zether, and Carcass, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus, to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown, in order to show the peoples and the princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command, at the king's command delivered by the eunuchs. At this, the king became enraged, and his anger burned within him. Then the king said to the wise men who knew the times, for this was the king's procedure, toward all who were versed in law and judgment, the men next to him being Karshina, Shether, Admatha, Tarshish, Meres, Marcina, and Memucan. 
the seven princes of Persia and Media who saw the king's face and sat first in the kingdom. According to the law, what is to be done to Queen Vashti because she has not performed the command of King Ahasuerus delivered by the eunuchs? Then Memucan said in the presence of the king and the officials, not only against the king has Queen Vashti done wrong, but also against all the officials and all the peoples who are in all the princes, provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's behavior will be made known to all women, causing them to look at their husbands with contempt, since they will say, King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. This very day, the noble women of Persia and Media who have heard of the queen's behavior will say the same to all the king's officials, and there will be contempt and wrath and plenty. If it please the king, let a royal order go out from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, so that it may not be repealed, that Vashti is never again to come before King Ahasuerus. And let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. So when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all his kingdom, for it is vast, all women will give honor to their husbands, high and low alike. This advice pleased the king and the princes, and the king did as Memucan proposed. He sent letters to all the royal provinces, to every province in its own script, and to every people in its own language, that every man be master in his own household and speak according to the language of his people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. What a gift it is to us, Lord, that we can know you know about you, we know about your grace and your mercy and your love, we know about the story of redemption, of deliverance. We praise you for that, Lord. We ask that you would help us as we continue in this story of deliverance in Esther, that you would help us, Lord, to hear. We pray it in Christ's name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Verses 10 and 11, the seventh day when the heart of the king was merry with wine. The last day of the second feast, the seventh day of that feast. And it says that seven eunuchs who served in the presence of the king were called to bring the queen before the king. I'm going to be honest, it would be very easy to just skip over the word eunuch here. And just use it interchangeably with servant, as has been done with different translations throughout the years. My flesh wants to do that, but I'm not going to do that. Not just because the story and history of eunuchs is heartbreaking, which it is, but also because eunuchs were not just an insignificant portion of the population in ancient times. Remember, even Jesus referred to eunuchs in Matthew And Philip shared the gospel with a God-fearing Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts. Boys, or sometimes men, were made eunuchs as a means of putting putting them into service for someone else, being forced into service for someone else, taking control of their bodies and subjecting them to life of servitude. It was common for the rulers of conquering nations to take prepubescent boys, children, from among the new subjects and castrate them. Their genitals would be crushed, mutilated, or removed. They would then be used for duties close to the king, sometimes important political roles. Since eunuchs were unable to leave a uh, genetic legacy, they could, they could not get married, they couldn't have children, It was thought that they would be more loyal to the king that they served. Eunuchs, as we're going to see, appear repeatedly in the book of Esther. Their importance is evident here in this text by the fact that they are mentioned by their names. One of the tasks for this group of eunuchs is to carry messages between the king and his harem. Eunuchs were also used for harem guards and body servants of the king. And so, We have these seven eunuchs, and they are sent to get the queen. Verse 12, but 
Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command delivered by the eunuchs. And at this, the king became enraged and his anger burned within him. Queen Vashti refuses. She won't come. But this is something you could not do. Refused to do what the king commanded, and yet she did. She refused. Now, what's happening here? The Midrash, which is the rabbinical teachings that have been passed down when teaching on the book of Esther, say that this was not just a request for the queen to come and be seen. The command was given for her to come wearing the crown, and according to the Midrash, only the crown. Both the Greek stories about Esther and the Midrashic explanation suggest that for Vashti to come would be tantamount to reducing herself to a concubine disgracing herself and signaling that she was available to other men. So Vashti here is clearly in a no-win situation. Does she dishonor herself and the king and his kingdom or disobey the king? We see in the text she chooses the latter in an attempt to preserve her own dignity and perhaps even that of her husband. Now, many Many have asked Would the king have even given such a command if he was not drunk? He acts on a drunken whim to show all the other drunken men at the party the beauty of his wife. This is about honoring himself, not the queen. She's just another possession to show off. I want to say something here in case you may feel that the text doesn't overtly say she was to come naked, and therefore we shouldn't presume that she did. Even if she was wearing more than just a crown, it is still a wicked command. And one that Vashti shouldn't comply with. She didn't want to be paraded in front of the king's drunken buddies to be at minimum heckled or worse, harmed by men who had been drinking for seven days. This refusal by Queen Vashti is a reminder of another story of a smart woman with a drunken husband. In 1 Samuel 25, you may remember Abigail acts on her own initiative while her husband Nabal is drunk and she's able to avert the danger that Nabal had brought about to his household. The king is, in Esther 1, embarrassed and we see that he is furious. This is a window into the king's heart. He's exceedingly angry at her refusal to come. But one thing we'll see in the book is that her refusal to come, that refusal to come, God uses that to preserve his people. Continues in verses 13 through 15. Then the king said to the wise men who knew the times, for this was the king's procedure toward all who were versed in law and judgment, the men next to him being Karshina, Shether, Admatha, Tarshish, Merez, Marcina, and Memucan, the seven princes of Persia and Media who saw the king's face and sat first in the kingdom. According to the law, what is to be done to Queen Vashti because she has not performed the command of King Ahasuerus delivered by the eunuchs? Now, this drunken angry king is now concerned with how to handle this domestic problem. What do we do? What can be done because of this great offense that Queen Vashti has committed? And so he calls the wise men. According to the law, what is to be done to Queen Vashti? And this is the response, verses 16 through 20. Then Mebuchadnezzar said in the presence of the king and the officials, not only against the king has Queen Vashti done wrong, but also against all the officials and all the peoples who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's behavior will be made known to all women, causing them to look at their husband with contempt, since they will say, King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. This very day, the noble women of Persia and Media who have heard of the queen's behavior will say the same to all the king's officials, and there will be contempt 
and wrath in plenty. If it please the king, let a royal order go out from him and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes so that it may, be, may not be repealed that Vashti is never again to come before King Ahasuerus. And let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. So when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all of his kingdom, for it is vast, all women will give honor to their husbands high and low alike. Now, what we have here in these five verses is a case of making a mountain out of a molehill. During the celebration of Purim, you may remember I mentioned last week, the Jews act this out in celebration of this every year. And the audience is loud and filled with laughter and boos throughout this performance. It's a comedy. And to be clear, when these five verses are acted out, the crowd erupts in laughter because of how ridiculous it is. The king may be inept and unable to act, but his advisors overcompensate with too much action. It seems that Memukin is more concerned with what this might mean for his own house than for this particular situation. And so Memukin's anxiety and the king's anger end up leading to a law based on fear rather than foresight. This is a man, King Ahasuerus, who is swayed by his passions, his preferences, and his peers. This is not something that needs to be done. He's not honoring his beautiful wife, but his passions, his own glory and the boasting in that to others, his preferences, that his every word and whim be obeyed, no matter how dishonoring or wicked it might be. And his peers, the words of those around him, lead him to make a dumb law. Consider what is said here by his advisor. Queen Vashti hasn't only done wrong to the king, no. She has done wrong to all the officials and all the peoples who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. All the women are going to hear that the queen would not come out and vulgarly parade herself in front of the king's drunk friends, and their response is going to be to look at their husbands with contempt. That's what they're saying to the king. So we've got to do something here. You know, that makes a ton of sense. Notice that they say that all will hear of the queen's behavior, like this is a disobedient child. And so they have a law written that cannot be repealed. That idea that a, a Persian law cannot be changed is found in the book of Daniel, by the way. They have this law written that Vashti, notice that, it doesn't say Queen Vashti any longer, it's Vashti, can no longer come before the king and let her position be given to another who is better than she. Yikes. You think about what is being said here, okay? Think about what is being said in this statement and pushing for this law. They think that all of the wives will act like Queen Vashti, but what does that presume? That the husbands will act like King Ahasuerus. They think all of the wives will act like Queen Vashti when their husbands act like King Ahasuerus. Good. <laughs> Let it be so. This is a wicked, wicked, sinful request. Verse 20, they're suggesting that the judgment against Vashti will not only be written into law, but the, the action taken by the king should be widely publicized so that it might serve as an example to the men and as a warning to the wives. And as a result will be that all women will give honor to their husbands, high and low alike. 
No imagination is needed to understand that what Memucan means by saying that someone better would be found as queen. He means who will obey the king the first time a command is given, every time a command is given, with a happy heart. And so it continues, verses 21 and 22. This advice pleased the king and the princes, and the king did as Memucan proposed. Sent letters to all the royal provinces, to every province in its own script, and to every people in its own language, that every man be master in his own household and speak according to the language of his people. The king, still drunk, is happy with this advice and sends out letters everywhere that every man be master in his own household. That phrase, and speak according to the language of his people is unclear, it's meaning uncertain. One commentator writes, it seems to be somehow related to each man being master of his own home, but the connection is not easy to make. Now, this whole situation is sad. Let me pause here. Yes, the writer is using this introduction to set the stage for everything that follows in the book of Esther. And yes, the Lord uses this to bring about the protection and deliverance of His people. But this also actually happened. And it's sad. And it had effects on many others, not just on Vashti. And we need to be clear that this is not a command from the Lord that this pagan king of the Persian Empire is issuing. This is not a thus says the Lord situation. Michael Fox writes very forthrightly, Xerxes, that's Ahasuerus, Xerxes, as we quickly learn, is weak-willed, fickle, and self-centered. He and his advisors are a twittery, silly-headed, cowardly lot who need to hide behind a law to reinforce their status in their home. And I need to confess that I didn't always read the text this way. I've been quick to write off Vashti as some sort of haughty wife or to agree with the king's counselors that she's going to be a bad influence on other wives. But the king and his Persian wise men are not the ones the writer wants me to identify with in this story. The entire theme of rescue and deliverance, as we're going to see throughout the book of Esther, is urging me to identify with the exploited, not with the exploiter. To cheer when justice is done and to boo when wickedness seems to prevail. And so, I reject an interpretation of this text that suggests the one who is wrong was the queen and who, ref who, who refused to dignify a drunken buffoon and his buddies. You know, what can we learn? That's what we're going to ask every single week. You can read a text like this, and it's like, let's pray. I mean, what do we learn from this, specifically about God? What do we learn about God? If you, if you weren't here last week, just as a, as a reminder for those who were and, and, and to let those who weren't know, God's name is not mentioned in the book of Esther. So what do we learn about God from a text like this? What we see in King Ahasuerus is antithetical to what we have in God. We're not called to imitate the ways or ideas of this king. We consider just a few examples we have in the text compared to what we see in God, our Lord. It's true, the Scriptures tell us that the Lord reigns over all, but, but we can also ask, how does He reign? Psalm 95.3 says, the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. In Psalm 96 verse 10, we're told to say among the nations, the Lord reigns. And He reigns over a people who are consistently and constantly refusing to do what He commands. 
Sometimes even when those people would say, I want to obey. He has every right to be offended and to enact swift justice. But what do we see and what do we know? The Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. He forgives iniquities. He loves to forgive. Whereas King Ahasuerus exploded in anger over this offense, an offense that was likely actually the right thing to do, the Lord is patient with us. He grants us grace upon grace upon grace. Do you notice how much grace was lacking in the text? There's no reaching out to the queen No seeking to determine what might be keeping her from coming and absolutely no willingness to extend grace. It was a swift and wicked response for the sake of pride and supposed honor. And she's banished from the king's presence forever. Can you imagine if God was like that? We would all be doomed. And we would deserve it. Because we have done far more than Vashti did. Far more. But even if we haven't, or even if we hadn't, because we all have, but even if we hadn't, James tells us in James chapter 2, verse 10, That whoever keeps the entire law and yet stumbles at one point is guilty of breaking all of it. And yet, even though my sins are too many to count, God has not only chosen to pour out grace, but has chosen reconciliation rather than my ruin. King Ahasuerus is swayed by his passions, preferences, and peers. Jesus is never changing and devoted to peace and the providential protection of all who belong to him. And Jesus' constant motivation is God's glory and our good. And consider how he displays that glory and seeks our good. Jesus is sacrificial. As a king, Ahasuerus is selfish, he's self-centered, but Jesus is sacrificial. Consider when he was in the upper room with the disciples just hours before he will be arrested, tortured, and crucified. In John chapter 13, verses 4 and 5, it says, he rose from supper, he laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. The one who had all the power in the room washed the feet of his disciples. Peter gets a lot of attention in that text because he pushes back. He washed the feet of all of the disciples including the one who would hand him over to those who would torture him and kill him. As Paul writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians 5.25, Christ truly loved the church and gave himself up for her. He is a great king and worthy of our worship. He's worthy for us to submit to him to follow Him. We're going to move into a time where we take the Lord's Supper. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 8, says this, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. 
And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. We remember this sacrifice for us each and every time we take the bread and we take the cup together. It's a gift to us. It's just a small symbol, the bread and the cup, just small symbols, but reminders of the greatest thing that we could ever possibly know. Jesus, the king of the universe, humbled himself, came to us, lived the life that we could never live, perfect and holy, and died the death that we could never endure, taking the suffering for our sins upon himself, So that whoever would come to him, whoever would believe in him, Jesus says, will not perish, but will have eternal life. Paul tells us in Romans that when we believe in him, we are counted as righteous. Meaning we are credited with with his life that he lived on earth, rather than keeping the record of our life that we live on earth. That's grace. So as you come and receive the bread and the cup from the front and take it back to your seats, let's just contemplate as we sing His mercy and His grace and enjoy, let's remember together as we take the bread and the cup. Let's pray. Father, thank You. Thank You for Your goodness and grace. Thank You that You are a King who is so far better than King Ahasuerus and so much better than me. Thank you that you reign with mercy and grace and benevolence on people. I pray, Father, that you would help us in this time. As we take the bread and the cup into our hands, we pray that you'd help us in our hearts to set you apart as Lord. If there's anyone here, Lord, who does not yet submit to you or know you, Lord, I pray that you would help them today to choose you, to partake of you rather than the bread and the cup. And for those of us who do know you, Lord, help us to love you. Help us to truly believe, to overcome our unbelief. Help us to glorify you in how we live, Lord, in the way that we love. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.